Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. Um, this is part two of my message series called Christmas is Forgiving. Christmas is Forgiving. And we talked about it being two different ways. We talked about Christmas being forgiving and like the word forgiveness. And we talked about Christmas being for giving, for space giving. And so it's two ways. And, and we kind of learned last week that truly one of the greatest gifts that was ever given to us was the very first Christmas gift when God himself gave us a forgiver. The first Christmas gift that was ever given when God was God himself giving us a forgiver. And we talked about that 2,000 years ago, God gave the greatest gift that he could ever give, and that was the gift of forgiveness to every one of us. Because Jesus Christ is the ultimate forgiver. Because of what he did and what he came to do, he's the ultimate forgiver. Because you see, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and was raised from the dead so that our sins could be perfectly forgiven. Can you say amen? amen? That's everything that we are. That one statement says everything about who we are and what we are and what Christ has done for us. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. He was raised from the dead so that our sins could be perfectly forgiven. So what does that mean? So what does it mean that Jesus came and did all those things for us and he forgave all of us perfectly in a perfect way? Remember the very title of my message, Christmas is Forgiving and Christmas is for giving. By Jesus Christ coming and doing what he did to us, it places us in a position, now listen, it places us in a position where we can in turn turn to others that have sinned against us and give them the greatest gift they could ever possibly receive from any of us and that's the gift of forgiveness. Because of what Jesus Christ did in our lives, it turns us around to a place where we can offer the greatest gift that was ever, ever given to us. That because we've been given forgiveness, that we can turn around and not only receive forgiveness, but we can be a forgiver ourselves. Now, I'm going I'm to let you in on a little secret today. That if you live long enough, nobody makes it through life pain-free. Nobody makes it through life pain-free. I saw my buddy Terry. Terry, where are you upstairs this morning? I saw Terry this morning. He came through the communion line. And Terry just had surgery on his back and his neck. And they took bone out of, take it out of your hip, Terry. Anyway, they took bone and kind of replaced some stuff in his neck, and he's got a collar on. And in any of you that have ever had, like, servo, that, that, that type of a surgery, it's very painful. And when he walked through the line this morning, I could see him walking, like, please don't hit me very hard. <laughs> None of us make it through life pain-free. Now, the kind of pain that I'm talking about this morning is not necessarily physical. And I know that we all have dealt with physical pain, maybe even some of you this morning, when you got out of bed and took your first step out of bed and your knee gave out or your hip gave out. She broke my hip. Maybe something happened this morning and you just begin to feel pain. I'm not talking about that kind of pain. I'm not talking about a headache. What I'm talking about is emotional pain. I'm talking about pain that it's when somebody sins against you or somebody does you wrong or somebody takes advantage or somebody has hurt you or maybe they haven't hurt you yet, but they will. And the question is not whether people are going to hurt you or not or whether they're going to do you wrong or leave you holding the bag or kind of give you the short end of the stick maybe. The question is, how are you going to respond when it happens to you? How are you going to respond when it happens to you? Now, I can promise you, if you know a pastor of a church, 
And most of you that are looking at me this morning think, I know one. I got this one right. If you're a pastor of a church, you have plenty of opportunities to practice forgiving. Because it seems like more and more people would say about what they want to about their pastor. You can go to any church in America, doesn't matter what congregation, denomination, location. And there's one thing you're going to find in church. It's bitterness. Bitterness. For whatever reason. I almost wish that on any given Sunday we had like metal detectors at the front like they have at the airport. That would, that would kind of see how much bitterness is walking through. Say, whoop, she's got it. Whoop, he's got it. Well, let me tell you something this morning. If you came through a bitterness detector this morning, you're in the right place. Yeah. You're in the right place this morning. I told Miss Jean, who sits beside me, usually on the front row, I told Miss Jean, I said, I need your help this morning. She said, what do you need, Pastor? I said, I need you to pray for me. I said, because this is a tough message. For many of us, this is going to be a gut check. And for many of us, this is going to be gut-wrenching. Because I'm going to call on many of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you to do something that you don't think you can do, you certainly don't want to do, you certainly didn't want anybody to tell you to do, and that's to forgive people in your past or even in your present. Maybe it's to forgive somebody that you rode in the car with this morning on the way to church. Somebody said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I resemble that remark. (laughs) Once again, this this is not, the the, the issue is not, is whether or not people are going to do things against you. Because I can promise you, as long as we live in this world, they are. Even this week. The issue is this. How are you going to respond? There's only two ways you're going to respond. One is bitterness. And one's forgiveness. That's it. There's two ways to respond. One's bitterness. And one's forgiveness. If uh, Herb's around or Herb in where one of you guys can call him on the radio, tell him to check the air because it's not running. And the reason I can tell it's not running, it's too quiet. I don't hear it blowing. And maybe that's a good thing this morning. But just have him check it this morning because there's no air moving in the building. Two ways you can respond when people hurt you. Bitterness or forgiveness. Now, we're going to study a passage that comes in the 18th chapter of Matthew. And if you want to turn there, you can turn there and have it. And I'm going to kind of be hovering around that area this whole morning. But Jesus said something, and it messed Peter up. Jesus was talking to Peter back and forth, and it really messed him up. Peter didn't like what he was talking about. And he said this. He said, if your brother sins, and this is chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother back. If he listens to you, you've won your brother back. Now, I'm sure at this point in his life, Peter kind of began to think about certain people that maybe he had been kind of put through the mill with. They had come and done something against him. So, and Peter began to wonder just how far this forgiveness thing had to go. And a few verses later in verses, verse 21, Peter comes to Jesus with a great question. Now look at this now. So Peter came to him and he said, hey Lord, don't you wish you had Peter's boldness just to come and say, hey Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? He says, up to seven times? Hey, Lord, when somebody does me wrong, how often do I go back and forgive them? Do I forgive them up to seven times? So he's saying, how many times do I have to forgive someone who's done me wrong before I can just beat the daylights out of them? Anybody say amen? Amen. See, y'all are in a whole different place this morning than I really need you to be. We need to be on the side of grace just a little bit more this morning. (laughs) How often do I have to forgive them before I just beat the daylights out of them? And then he makes a suggestion. Go back to the verse, if you would. He makes a suggestion. Look at the last part. Up to seven times. 
I mean, could you, could you just say, hey, Lord, if my brother sins against me, should I forgive him? Up to seven times. Serious? Seven times I'm going to forgive him? Now, why do you think Peter uses this number seven? Well, in the Jewish culture that they demanded, that, that if, when you did wrong, three times was what they would always tell you to forgive. It's kind of like three strikes and you're out. So what Peter does, he says, well, in my culture, if I forgive somebody three times, I tell you what I'll do. I'll double down, Jesus. I'll double down. I'll say six plus one. So Jesus, if somebody does something against me, how about seven? How about if I go twice as much as my culture would say and then put one to go on? So Jesus looks at Peter, and he has the Disciple of the Year Award already in his hand. And Jesus said back to him in verse 22, look at this. He said, and so Jesus said to him, I say to you, up, not up to seven times, but up to how many? Seven times. Seventy times seven. Now, for some of you math whiz, I know you're already going, 490. <laughs> so that 500th time, I do not have to forgive him. It wasn't a math lesson. He wasn't saying, get your calculator out and figure out what it's going to be. What he was saying was, not seven times, but 70 times seven. He's saying, don't count it. And don't keep score. Because there's truly, it's unlimited how much we should forgive others. Why? Because there is no limit on God's forgiveness of you. He was saying, hey, Peter. Nope. Not three, not six, not seven, but 70 times seven. It's unlimited how many times you should forgive because there is no limit of God's forgiveness on you. In other words, the scorecard has to be ripped up. The scorecard has to be done away with. If, some, if someone sins against you the first time, you forgive that brother and then you promise not to never hold it against him, and he sins against you again, you can't say, oh, that's two. No, what you got to do is back it up and say, that's one. That's one. Even the word forgiveness is hard. The word forgiveness is tough. It only appears 17 times. 17 times. And interest, interestingly, when it appears, it's not necessarily talking about the way that we think of forgiveness. You know what it's talking about, Claude? It's talking about a commercial term. A financial term. It means to release a person from obligation. It means to release a person from obligation. Or to cancel out a debt. To forgive a debt. Every Sunday we make the confession, debt's what? Demolished. Wiped away. Clean. Debt free. So when, it, when the word forgiveness come, comes in the Bible 17 times, it's always talking about canceling something out. It's not talking about canceling part of it out it's not a score it's not a score it's wiping it clean do over start over let go the good old hymn of the church you know what that one was right let it go let it go that's it let it go send away Forgiveness is when you recognize that somebody owes you big time for what they've done to you, but you cancel the debt. You write it off and you forget it. How many of you have a hard time with that statement? Forgiveness is when you recognize that somebody owes you big time for what they've done for you and to you, but you cancel the debt. You write it off. You forget it. One great psychologist said, forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. It's a pretty good word right there in the viv. I understand that some of you are sitting there right now and you've done, took your paper and made an airplane out of it and laid it beside of you and you're about to blow, you're, you're, you're about to blow a gasket and you're thinking, I do not want to hear this. And you've already got your phone out and you're shopping for something that, for somebody off Amazon. And don't say you don't. 
Because when you come in here on a Sunday morning and you attach yourself to FCC guest, what you're really attaching yourself to is FCC, you want to know what I'm looking at? Because <laughs> every week we get a printout of everybody that comes into church on any given Sunday. And y'all, we ain't the only ones if you go to Starbucks, wherever. Anything that you've been looking at on your phone, when you walk in and you attach to their Wi-Fi, they have lists of where you've been and where you're going. So some of you right now are going, oh, Lord, I can't. <laughs> delete, 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 delete. But some of you don't want to hear what I'm saying. And you want anything to be a distraction to you this morning. But pastor, you just don't know what this person's done to me. You don't know how many times I've already forgiven this person. Lord, I'm, I'm up to 489 right now. I'm right there at the brink of what you said. You don't know the agony that this person or these persons have put me through. And so some of you are still asking a big question. Why? Why should I forgive others no matter what they've done to me? Why should I just roll over? Why can't I beat the daylights out of them? They deserve it. So here's your question. Why should I forgive others? Here's your answer. Because I've been forgiven by God. That's the only reason. That's it. Why? Why should I do it? Because, because you have received the ultimate gift that could ever be given. And that's the gift that he's given us. God forgives us so that we can and we will forgive others. He forgives us. He's offered us the gift of forgiveness. Let me tell you the crazy thing about a gift, though. If I'm going to give somebody a gift, come here, Patrick. If I'm going to give Patrick a gift, two things have to happen. I have to be willing to give it, and then he has to be willing to receive it. There's a scripture that says, freely ye have what? Received, freely do what? Freely ye have received, freely give. Now in this parable that Jesus gives us in the 18th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is going to show us of what real forgiveness looks like. He's going to show us what it results in. He's going to show us how real forgiveness should affect us. Maybe not the one who was forgiven, but certainly the one who is doing the forgiving. And I hope that every one of you in the here, they're here this morning, no matter who that person is or what they've done, can take the gift that's been given you of forgiveness and give it to somebody else. And give it to somebody else, even though they don't deserve it. Even though they don't deserve it. See, there was something that was given to us when Jesus died on the cross. I can promise you we weren't deserving of it. So let's look. That's my introduction. That's good, ain't it, Dad? That's what Daddy always says. He's been 18 pages into his stuff. And Daddy says, now that's my introduction. <laughs> so let's look at number one. Everybody read it with me. Forgiveness is free, but it's not cheap. Wow. Forgiveness is free, but it sure ain't cheap. You've heard it said before, there's no free lunch. That's certainly true when it comes to forgiveness. Because even though something may be free, the price may be zero, it does not mean that behind that free price is not a tremendous cost. Even though something may be free, and the price of it may be zero, it still doesn't mean that behind that free price, it didn't cost somebody something. Let's look at 18th chapter of Matthew again. Now look at this. This is verses 23 through 25. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Now look, when he had begun to settle them, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. 10,000 talents. But since he didn't have the means to repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. Now, what Jesus was describing here was unusual. There was then, just as there used to be in our country, a debtor's prison. There was a debtor's prison where people would be thrown in jail for money that they didn't know. 
Aren't you glad we don't have that anymore in the United States? Look at somebody beside you and say, I'm so glad that house payment would have put me over the edge. But Jesus tells about a man that owed a huge sum of money. Now, how much did he owe? The Bible says he owed 10,000 talents. Now, to give you an idea of 10,000 talents, the, the entire tax on the, listen, the entire tax that the whole area of Galilee received in a year was 200 talents. The entire tax that his whole city received in 12 months was only 200, and he owed 10,000. The man owed 50 years of taxes. 50 years of taxes. In order to put it another way, he, he would have had to work, listen to this, this is how much he owed. He would have had to work 20 years of his life to repay one talent. He would have worked 20 years to repay one talent. So if you multiply that out, he would have had to work 500 years, 500 years to pay back this tax, and that's with zero interest. Zero interest. It, it would be us, the average, the average salary in the United States at this point is about $50,000. $50,000. So if that's the case, this man owed in, the, in an equivalent of $10 billion in taxes. Think about that. $10 billion, billion in taxes. <laughs> in other words, it was unpayable. There was no way that this man could ever pay it. It was totally impossible. There was no way he could ever pay back what he had stolen. And so the next verse is hilarious. Look at this. He said, so the man fell to the ground, prostrated himself before saying, just have patience with me, Lord, and I'll repay you everything. Seriously? Just have patience with me because I know I should be able to live to, what, 550, 560. And I can work every year. I'll make it, Lord. I can promise you, hell would freeze over and Hillary and Trump would be friends before that right there would happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. No way. Ain't no way it's going to happen. So look, so if you look at this parable that Jesus has given, let, let's look at what it represents. Do you understand what the debtor means? You know, you know who the debtor in this represents? The debtor is me and you. The one that owed a debt that could impossibly be paid is you and I. And you know what the debt is in this parable that Jesus is talking about? The debt is sin. The debt is sin. And the king in this parable is God himself. So in the parable, he's talking about you and I and a sin debt that we owed and the king. What Jesus is saying is, hey, you may be a good person. You may have done a lot of good things. You may have done a, made a whole lot of great choices in your life. But before a holy and a righteous God, there's a sin debt that you owe that you absolutely could not pay. Now, I'm building my case for you, okay? Stay with me. No matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many days you attend church, no matter how many Sunday school pins you have, all those things, it would have taken the best human being that has ever lived and turned everything that they've done and turned it into gold, gold, and they still wouldn't be able to make a down payment on the sin debt that they owed. That's why you see in a moment that forgiveness is free, but it certainly isn't cheap. Forgiveness is free, but it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Even though the price of forgiveness has to be zero, it really isn't forgiveness. The cost of forgiveness is inf infinitely great. The cost of forgiveness is infinitely great. It may be free, but it costs somebody something. It's going to cost the king a great deal because he, he's owed $10 billion. Jesus looked at him and said, I can tell you, forgiveness may be free, but it's costly. And then Jesus kind of takes a completely shocking turn. Because the assumption at that point would have been the debtor goes to jail. He goes to the debtor prison and the story's over. But then Jesus illustrates what else is true about, a forg about forgiveness. Look at this, number two. Forgiveness is full and it's not partial. Forgiveness is full and it's not partial. So in verse 27, it says, And the Lord of that slave 
And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. And read the rest with me. And released him and forgave him the debt. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. Now, if you had been in that crowd that day, you would have heard, do what? (laughs) What? Seriously? Even though he had the right to sell this man and his family, even though the highest rate you could get for a slave was only one talent, If he had sold his wife and his family and all of his children and grandchildren, he still wouldn't have a 1% of what the man owed. Instead, what the king does is, look look at this now, I love this. Instead, what he does, he took the man's debt and turned it into a personal loan and pays the loan off himself. He set him free. Then put it another way. The king took what was a bad debt and turned it into a paid note which became a gift that he gave to this man that he paid for out of his own pocket. The king took what was a bad debt and turned it into a paid note, which became a gift that he gave to this man that he paid out of his own pocket. Now, so you can see what happened immediately. The debtor owed a debt he couldn't pay And the king paid a debt he didn't owe. Let me say that again. So what happened? The debtor owed a debt that he couldn't pay. And the king paid a debt he did not owe. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Let that sink in for just a minute. Now I want you to take your mind and move it from the courthouse where the parable is taking place. And move it to the cross. You see, because... The cross is where the ultimate financial transaction of forgiveness for the entire world took place. The cross is where the ultimate financial transaction of forgiveness for the entire world took place. Jesus Christ took the sin debt of every one of us, of every person who had ever lived, and paid for it by his blood. We owed a sin debt that we couldn't pay. And he paid a sin debt that he didn't know. Remember the last words of Jesus? The last words of Jesus on the cross said, It is finished. It is finished. That's a Greek word that means paid in full. Paid in full. Whenever a loan was completely paid, There'd be a a receipt at the top or a receipt given on the bottom. It'd be a stamp on it. And in the Greek, it'd be one word. And that one word meant finished, paid in full. You don't owe another dime. And what that piece of paper proved, that the debt that you had was canceled. Nothing else was owed. And financially, you had a complete bill of health. Because you see, when someone is forgiven the same way, the way that they ought to be forgiven, when someone is forgiven the way they should be forgiven, it's full and not partial. It's full and not partial. It's it's not, hey, I I, I tell you what, I'll forgive you if you, or I'll forgive you when you, When someone is forgiven and you've forgiven them, you forgive them freely and they're forgiven fully. There's no partial payment of forgiveness. That's the way that God forgave us. Free. No strings attached. No strings attached. It was given what? Freely. But it cost somebody something. 
Number three, I'm almost finished. Forgiveness must be final and not temporary. It is finished. Today, I'm not going past this day anymore without telling you this is over. Matthew 18, 27 says, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and did what? Released him and forgave him the debt. What happened? What just happened? The slave was clean. The slate was clean. The debt was canceled. The prisoner was released. The book was closed. Nothing was left hanging over anybody, anybody's head. There was no fine print at the bottom of the contract. Not only was the debt forgiven, but the debt was... It's finished. It's over. I'm through with it. We're not going back here anymore. Today I went back to the house where I used to live and my little boy ran and hid behind the door. And I said, son, you don't have to worry because you've got a brand new daddy now. Thanks to Calvary, we don't live there anymore and we're not going back there anymore. Amen. Not only was the debt forgiven, but it was forgotten. This is important for you to understand because you have a choice as to whether you're going to forgive somebody or not. You got two options. You got two options. Even though somebody owes you a debt and they really did mess over you. And they really, really did something wrong to you. And they really, really owe you big time. On the one hand, you could hold the debt over the top of their head. You could hold the debt over them. You see, for the rest of your life, you could think, there's a person who did this to me. Or there's a person who took my whatever. Or there's the person that owes me this. And you can hold that over them forever. And I can promise you, a lot of the people that you need to forgive, they don't even have a clue. Remember me riding Lynn around on my back and carrying that unforgiveness around on my back? That was the dumbest thing I ever done. <laughs> Those of you that weren't here, I picked one Sunday to talking about you know, the, carrying around people on your back that, that was unforgiveness. I carried Lynn Wheeler on my back. I paid for it with a chiropractor for about two weeks. No, not really. But it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Because you're carrying around that burden of that unforgiveness on your back. And so the choice is you can try to hold that debt over them that may, they may not even know about it. They may not even know about the hurt that they did. Or they may really know about it. And all they want to do is just keep digging you for the rest of your life, and you're allowing them to. You're allowing them to. You're allowing them to stay in that place. You're allowing them to put you in that place and keep you in that place. So the hurt that was caused on the initial oh, whatever is still digging at you days and weeks and years later. Is anybody on that page with me? You've you been there? So you can hold it over them. And you can wait for the time when vengeance comes to you. Or you can choose to forgive them. You can hold it over them or you can choose to forgive. Because see, real forgiveness is when you make the decision to release that person from the debt. To release. Let it go. Let them go. You release them from the obligation. The obligation is that he owes you what he took from you. And your choice is to cancel the obligation. It's when you look at that person. Come here, Scott. It's when you look at that person and you say, you owe me a debt that you could never repay. But I'm going to pay a debt to you that I don't owe. And I'm going to give it to you in forgiveness. So I forgive you. Thank you. So I forgive you. You could never pay back enough for what you've done to me. You could never ever know the nights that I have lost sleep over you. You have been on my rear end since you did that to me. 
You have been hounding me like a hound dog on the back of my heels since you hurt me. He looked at me and goes, man, I didn't even know what I did. Dummy. (laughs) Sorry, Scott. (laughs) I want to lay before everybody in this room a choice. But before you make your choice, I want to recap just for a second. Every one of us has a king over us, and his name is Jesus Christ. And every one of us in this room owed him an insurmountable, unpayable debt called sin that he's paid for us, and he's given us. And he's given it to us freely. Does he demand reimbursement? Because he forgave us instead of requiring us a pound of flesh? Just imagine if Jesus said, I'll forgive you, but if your feet walk the wrong road, I'm going to cut your feet off. And if your eyes look twice where they should have only looked once, I'm going to blind you. Or he said, if you use your tongue for bad instead of good, I'm going to cut it out. What if Jesus put stipulations on his forgiveness? I'm telling you, if he did that to me, I would be one big maimed, deformed person. I would be funky looking walking down the road. Wouldn't you? I mean, we would be, you know, (laughs) terrible. But he didn't do that. Because with God, forgiveness is free and it's full and it's final. It's free and it's full and it's final. You think about how long you have been knowing in your mind that this person owes you. And how long you've been carrying that debt. You think about the king in the story. If that man owed 10,000 talents and it was going to take him 500 years to pay it all back. Think about how long it took him to accrue that debt. And think about what, John, think about what the interest would be. On that much. Think about how much the interest would accrue every day. So the king definitely had a reason to hold something over this man's head. And so do you probably. Have every reason in the world to hold it over their head. So I want to ask you something this morning. Who owes you? Who owes you? Who is it that's in your debt? Who do you want to grab around the throat, Trav, and say, pay up or else? It's hard, ain't it? I can promise you, you got a choice. You can, you can sleep in that bed of bitterness for the rest of your life, or you can be locked behind the bars, or you can eat out of a bowl of bitterness, whatever you want. Or you can say, with God's help, I forgive you and just give that person over to God. You can stay bitter or forgiveness. Remember at the beginning, there's two choices. Bitterness, forgiveness. Before you choose your answer this morning to either one of those questions, what you're going to choose, bitterness or forgiveness, I want to remind you what I said at the very beginning. Why should you forgive that person? Why should you? What, what's, what's your reasoning? What, Pastor, why should I even go there? They're not worth it. They're they're not worth the breath that I would use to utter the three words, I forgive you. They are not worth my time. Well, I can tell you this. I'm so glad that when Jesus forgave us of a debt that we absolutely couldn't pay back, that he didn't look at me and say, why should I? Why should I? He ain't worth it, Mike. Why should I forgive him? He ain't worth it. No matter what that person's owe you, no matter what that person owes you, it could never be greater than what the debt was that you owed to God. Never. I said at the beginning that God forgives us so that we can and we will forgive others. 
If you look at that person today and you've walked in here angry and bitter towards somebody, I want, you, I want just to encourage you to look up to heaven today and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not being forgiven. And when I look at that person and say, with God's help and with God's grace, I forgive you. Because you see, God forgives so that we can and we will forgive others. Last week I talked about forgive me. That the greatest thing that God ever did was send Jesus. The greatest gift he ever gave was the gift of a forgiver. And we talked about at the beginning of my message this weekend, last week, Christmas is forgiving. Christmas is for giving. So the greatest thing that we've ever been given is the gift of forgiveness. And the greatest gift that you could ever give someone else in your life is to forgive them. Let them go. Let them go. Last week, forgive me. This week, forgive you. Next week, the title of my message is Forgive Not. You can. You find another set of keys? Here, hand me that mic, Scott. Thank you, sir. Unforgiveness, when he said it sets that person free, it releases Hey, Kevin, them. turn her up. It's number 11. Unforgiveness, when Wesley said it's like um, releasing somebody, mm -hmm. really when you hold um, forgiveness from somebody, it's, it keeps you in prison. And it's like you are the one in prison. And you look to somebody to let you out. You know, you're looking for, and it, I thought about my key ring. I have different keys for different reasons. And sometimes for us to get out of that prison, we'll use any other key but forgiveness. You know, like the, the sad thing is you're in prison and unforgiveness is holding you there. And you're looking to everybody else to make you feel better about it. But you're the one, the key is in the cell with you. And everybody outside wants you free more than you want you free. But you have to use the key and let yourself out. And that key is forgiveness. But the thing is, a lot of times, instead of taking that key of forgiveness and letting yourself out, you'll use the key of, that's okay, I'll just get another friend. That's okay, I'll just get another drink. Let's see, that's okay. I'll just watch another movie. But what happens is you might try all those things to make you feel better about it, but you're still in prison. And now you've got a whole long laundry list of other guilty things to feel guilty about to bring condemnation on you on top of the person that you're holding unforgiveness against. And you're like, Lord, set me free. Please set me free. And he's saying, you've got the key. I wish I could. I wish I could go unlock your door and let you go. But you've got the key. And the key is called forgiveness. And when you stick that key of forgiveness in there and you release that person, guess who's free? Good. Good. <laughs> Will you stand up with me this morning? Tough, ain't it? I told you. I, you thought I was kidding when I told you to pray for me. I wasn't kidding. Father, whoever that one is, whoever that one is that really probably deserves a punch in the mouth or a punch in the gut, We choose today, Lord. We make a choice. We make a choice to pick up the key that's going to open the prison that we're in and allow us to come out. And by doing that, Lord, we give the greatest gift that we could ever give to someone else, and that's a gift of forgiveness. 
Lord, I know in my own life there have been many people that have come that I should just say let it go. And I've held on to it. And it's even defined part of who I am. So today, Lord, I just come to you and I ask you to give me the strength. To give me the strength that I need in myself. Because I know, Lord, somebody else cannot do this to me because they didn't. I mean, somebody else cannot do this for me because they weren't wronged. I was the one that was wrong. Father, that's why you sent your son. Nobody else could do it for us except for your son. So we thank you, Jesus, for the greatest gift that you gave us, and that's a gift of forgiveness. And I ask you, Lord, to give us the strength and the wherewithal and the choice to not choose bitterness anymore, but to choose forgiveness. So, Father, I, I just ask you that here three weeks before Christmas, that truly, Lord, we can offer someone the greatest gift that they could ever be given. And that's a gift of forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, that the forgiveness that we give them would not be partial, but it would be a full-blown go. Go, I forgive you. Just go. I'm not going to mess with you anymore. I'm not going to tote you around anymore. And as I let you go, I know that the bars that are around me are going to fall around me, and I am free. I am free from the bitterness and the unforgiveness that I've been carrying. So, Lord, I thank you for this Christmas, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to truly give forgiveness. I thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity that I have today to speak your word and to set your people free by your word. Lord, you told us in your word that the truth is what sets us free. So I thank you that I've had the opportunity today to put forth the truth to everyone that's listening to my voice today. We honor you, Jesus. We love you. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and love one another. So, Lord, give us the strength to give the gift that we have of forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said together. Love somebody before you leave.